the title that I've given uh, to this, I'm sure makes some of you smile, particularly if you're Disney fans or you've um, seen the movie or the musical, but uh, I did not name it um, The Lion King just because it's connected to Disney. Um, I, I named this The Lion King is Coming because that is an apt, accurate description of Jesus Christ when he returns in the last days. The Lion King is coming. And I think as we progress through this uh, presentation, I think that you will come to realize that that is an apt and accurate description of Jesus Christ in the last days. But as we are getting going, I want you to, I want you to get your Bibles out if you have them with you. Uh, if you have your iPad or your phone and you have a Bible app on there, I strongly suggest you get that out. I will be taking you from Genesis to Revelation. So I hope you've got a few hours. <laughs> now we'll, we'll do it quickly. But I want to give you, I want to give you a, a view from 30,000 feet. I want to take you through, and I'm going to focus us on some specific things, but I'm going to just touch on them as we go, and we're going to hit these different passages as we go, because I want you to come away from this really grasping who Jesus is and what he's going to do and what his credentials are. But I want you to see, I want you to see Jesus in a particular light, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Let's turn, if you would, to Genesis 3.15. I'm just going to touch here for a moment. And before we reread that verse, I want to pose to you the issue or challenge or problem of all of human history. When mankind fell after God created them, there was a huge dilemma. Now, when I say this, I'm saying this in human terms. Nothing is a problem or a challenge or a dilemma for God. He's got it all worked out in advance. But from our human understanding, there was a major crisis or dilemma. And after mankind fell, after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, this was the problem. How can a holy God, who is just, righteous, and holy, find a way to rescue humanity and yet at the same time remain true to his nature and character. After mankind fell, rebelled against God, the ending, if you want to play it out, was death, was eternal separation from God. And the issue of the ages for all of human history, if you want to understand human history, you can define it by the answer that God gave to this question. How can a holy God who is just righteous. How does he redeem that lost creation and at the same time stay true to his nature and character? He can't cheat to say, well, I'll give you a little bit of, a little bit of help. I'll, I'll find a way to, to, to cut the corners because, you know, I made you and, and you're beautiful and it's my vision. And so I'll just cut the corners to, to, to make it all. He had to do it in such a way that he would remain true and faithful to all of his characteristics because his nature and character is what makes him who he is. He can be nothing other than true and faithful to his own character. So how does he do it? Well, we get an indication of this in Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity, he's talking to Satan here, the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It, the woman's seed, shall bruise thy head, and thou and your seed, Satan, shall bruise his heel. This is the first indication that we have that there is going to be a seed, a seed of a woman, of a human woman, that is going to, in the final analysis, crush the Satan crush the serpent's head and defeat him. This is an indication that there is a human means by which God is going to accomplish his purposes to bring redemption to a lost and fallen world that is absolutely hopeless unless God provides a way through. Do you understand? Turn with me, if you would, over to Genesis chapter 49. 
Genesis chapter 49. Before we read in Genesis chapter 49, I want to explain to you briefly the nature of God himself. The nature of God himself. He is known in scripture, specifically we're talking about Jesus Christ, who would come as the savior of the world. Jesus Christ is known as the God-man the God-man. This is crucial. This is not just semantics or academics. This is crucial for you to understand the whole plan of God for the redemption of humanity. Jesus Christ, when he came, was the God-man. But we are, he's foretold this coming seed, this promised one, this one that would bring uh, victory to humanity through his death on the cross. He is the God-man. There is a dual nature of Jesus Christ. He is 100% divine, 100% God, and he's also 100% human. This is called in theological terms the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union. Jesus Christ, the God-man, is 100% divine and 100% human. Now, stick with me just for a moment. We don't question the humanity of Jesus Christ from all of the stories that we read in Scripture and everything we know about what Jesus did. He was born in human terms in a real place, Bethlehem, in a manger. He lived as a human for 33 years. He died on a Roman cross. He was buried in a real tomb, and he rose again on the third day. Human. So for his first coming, we are apt to think in terms of who Jesus is in his human, ter- in human terms. We look predominantly, when we think of his first coming, as him as human. Now we know he is God's son, and we know he was perfect. We know he was sinless. But we think of him in terms of being in hu- a human. But I want to submit to you that when we think of Jesus Christ in relation to his second coming, we really don't think of him in terms of being human very much. When we think about it and we ask the question to people who are discerning and say, yeah, okay, yeah, I can see that. But we really think of Jesus Christ in terms of his deity when we think of the second coming of Jesus Christ, when we think of his return. I want to emphasize to you, I don't want to, let me back up, I don't want to de-emphasize the fact that he is 100% divine. Of course he is 100% divine, and he is, he is God. But I want to emphasize to you the humanity of Jesus Christ and why that's important not to lose sight of when you're, when you're discussing his second coming, okay? It has a significant bearing on what he will do, who he is, how he will come, what he will accomplish at his second coming. So don't lose sight of the physical human nature of who Jesus Christ is. So now let's move on and let's look at some verses. Genesis chapter 49. And in the context of Genesis 49, in verse 1, it says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. So here you have the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac, this is Jacob, and he calls his sons together, the 12 sons or the, that were the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, he calls them together and he says, let me tell you that which is going to befall you in the last days, in the last days. And he goes through and he's talking to his different sons, uh, Simeon and Reuben, and some of the attributes they have, what's going to be taking place, and he gets, to, he gets to verse 10 of Genesis 49. And what does he say to Judah? He says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and until him shall the gathering of the people be. So let's unpack this just for a minute. To Judah, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, who, is the, who will be the father of the tribe of Judah. And he says to you, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. What is scepter? Kingship. Kingship. So kingship 
shall not depart from Judah. In other words, the king, the ultimate king is what's in view here. The ultimate king who will come, that promised seed from Genesis 3.15, he is going to come through the tribe of Judah. This is where it's given to us. It says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. In other words, this individual who will come, that's king, he will be a lawgiver. He will establish the law until Shiloh come and until him shall the gathering of the people be. In other words, the people will move and gather to him. He will be king and he will give the law and set the parameters for his kingdom. So this is giving us a sense of, okay, it's taking the concept further of the seed that's promised in Genesis 3.15. And now we're talking about where is the seed coming from? The tribe of Judah. That's where the king will come. Now, if you'd follow me further to Psalm 89, 3. I have made a what? Covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. So now we're narrowing it down even further. We're told in Genesis 3 that there's a seed that's coming that will crush the serpent's head. In Genesis 49, we're told which tribe that this individual will come through. Judah, and he will be the king. Now in Psalm 89, and there are other passages as well that can demonstrate this. I've just chosen these. Verse 4, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Look over at verse 20 of Psalm 89. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. Skip over to verse 28 of Psalm 89. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. Did King David live forevermore? No, but will King David's seed, will his greater son, Jesus Christ, live forevermore? Yes. Absolutely. So what we have is a narrowing down of this, the humanity of this individual. Once again, in Genesis 3.15, the promise of a seed that will crush the serpent's head. In Genesis 49, we're told that he will come through the tribe of Judah. And now we're narrowing it down further to the seed or offspring of King David, who was Israel's greatest king historically. King David's greater son, of course, we know will be Jesus Christ. So let's look further in Psalm 89, 28. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. Verse 29, his seed also will I make to endure forever. King David's seed, the king that will come through him, will endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Now listen to this. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. In other words, if my people turn away, if the Jewish people don't keep my commandments, I will chastise them, I will punish them appropriately, but I will never, I will never take away my covenant or my promise. Verse 33, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break. This is God speaking. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness. God cannot swear by anything greater than himself. He swears by himself that I will not lie unto David. I've made a covenant. Your seed will rule and reign, David, and I can swear by no other that I promise I will not lie to you, that I will never break my covenant. Verse 36, his, she, his seed shall endure forever. Once again, was King David, did he endure forever? No. So what is in view here clearly is King David's greater son, Jesus Christ. Verse 37, it shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Turn over, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 2. Once again, 
We're looking for credentials and we're looking for location as it relates to this individual who is a human, who will come as a human. He is God, 100% God, but he has 100% human qualities. He is, his nature is human as well. Isaiah chapter 2. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah, that's the tribe through which the promised seed would come, Judah, and Jerusalem. Where is Jerusalem? In what, in what tribal area was Jerusalem? Judah. And it shall come to pass, when? In the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations. This is the promised seed, once again. He will judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now I ask you a question. In everything we just read, is there anything there that indicates that this is not a real physical location? That the, ki that the coming kingdom will not be a real physical location? All of this is indicative of the place where he will set up and establish his kingdom. Judah, the tribal allotment, and Jerusalem, this is where Jesus Christ as king will set up his kingdom. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the, of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Very physical. This is a physical description. Many people shall go and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. How can people who are, if they're not living in a physical earth, how can they walk up and say, come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord to worship him in his, in his millennial kingdom? This is physical. This is, this is on earth. So he will judge among the nations and shall rebuke. So clearly, this has not happened yet. This is still future. So this is an identification of not only who, but where he will rule from in his future earthly millennial kingdom. Turn with me, if you would, over to Isaiah 9, 6. I love this one. This is a very well-known Christmas verse. Isaiah 9, 6. Many of you could probably recite it by heart, but maybe, maybe we missed something as, if, as we're looking. The very first phrase. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And I have to tell you from my perspective, I read that verse hundreds of times through the years, hearing it at Christmas time, and I just I would recite it, it would just come off my tongue, and I kind of thought it was saying the same thing twice in the first phrase. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Okay, it's the same thing. No. The two aspects of Jesus and his nature are in that, that phrase. For unto us a child is born. Perfect humanity. Perfect humanity. Unto us a son is given. Whose son is he? God's son. Undiminished deity. So you have the two natures of Jesus Christ in this phrase. For unto us a child is born. Perfect humanity. 100% God. 100% human. And unto us a son is given. Undiminished deity. 100% divine. Now look, what does it say about him? and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He's gonna rule and reign. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. This is Jesus Christ, 100% human, 
100% divine. His government will last forever. There shall be no end upon the throne of David. David. So don't lose the fact that he is the greater son, the promised seed of King David, who was Israel's historic greatest king. To order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Turn over, if you would, to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. This is the very first verse of the very first chapter of the very first writer recorded here in the New Testament. And what of all the things that Matthew could have said in the very first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the New Testament? The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, Christ meaning the anointed one of the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, why did he choose, of all the things he could have said, to say that? Because he is saying, he's screaming it. The Messiah, the one who has all the credentials, the one who is 100% divine and 100% human, has all the credentials and he has the bloodline. He is the one of whom the Old Testament writers foretold. He's here. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's how important Matthew believed that it was to make the point that he fits all of the criteria of the promised seed going all the way back to Genesis 3.15, the one of whom we have put all of our hope and trust. If he doesn't have the credentials, if he doesn't have the right or the authority, then we're living a lie based on the fact that we think he's going to be able to have the power to save us. He must be the one that fits the description of the credentials from the Old Testament writers. Turn over, if you would, to Revelation chapter 5. I want to give you the context of Revelation chapter 5. The scene is the throne room in heaven of God Almighty. He is sitting on the throne, and in his right hand, he has a scroll. And that scroll is sealed with seven seals. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what's so critical about this scene and what is happening here is that God the Father, sitting on the throne in heaven, holding that scroll, that scroll is the title deed to planet Earth. That scroll is the title deed to planet Earth. Let's read in Revelation 5. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written, or scroll written within and on the back side, and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof? Who has the right and the credentials to step forward and to take that scroll out of the hand of God the Father, this title deed to planet Earth, and bring history to a proper consummation? Who is worthy to do it? This is the issue of why we've been tracking who the seed is. Because if there's no seed that is worthy to open the scroll and to bring history to a proper consummation, then you and I are dying in our sins with no hope of eternity in heaven. Verse 3. And no... What's the next word? And no man in heaven, no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So the search is for a man, a man, because it has to be a man who redeems mankind. Mankind sinned against God, rebelled against God. It must be a man that pays the sin price for the rest of humanity. 
So the search is made for a man. And no man in heaven or in earth, neither under the earth. This was an extensive universal search. This was so crucial because the search was everywhere you could possibly think of. In heaven, in earth, under the earth, nobody was able to open the book, not even to look on it. That's how unworthy humanity was, is. Verse four, and I wept, this is John, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. When it says I wept much, it's like the understatement of the ages. He's, he's crying out loud, sobbing audibly, because he understands if no man is found to step forward who is worthy to open that scroll and to loose the seals and bring history to a proper consummation, then all hope is lost for all of humanity, for all of time. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, stop weeping. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah, all the way back from Genesis 49. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Why is it so important that this is listed? The lion of the tribe of Judah, once again, because he has the right, the power, the authority, and is worthy. He has the credentials. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Remember we narrowed it down? The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. So here you have the lion and the lamb. Jesus Christ, at both comings, are in view here. The lion and the lamb. The lamb came the first time to give himself, to offer himself as a sacrifice on the cross of Calvary for the sin of humanity. He's the lamb. But the lion is coming back in power and glory to take his rightful place as king of the earth. Verse 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. So Jesus steps forward and takes the scroll out of the hand of God the Father. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Can you imagine why they sang? because they understood the implications of the fact that one was found worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals and bring history to a proper consummation. All of humanity was hanging in the balance. Of course they sang a song. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Verse 10, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. earth. Once again, the physical, literal kingdom of a human, 100% human Savior, Messiah, and 100% God on the earth, his kingdom on the earth. We shall reign with him on the earth. If you know him, you have trusted him as your personal savior from sin, you will reign with him on the earth when he returns to take his rightful place as king. Turn over if you would, and we're getting to, close to the end here. Revelation, literally close to the end, Revelation 22. I told you I'd take you from Genesis to Revelation, right? <laughs> Revelation 22, and look at verse 16. Now, these are the words of Jesus himself. This is the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. And in Revelation 22:16, 16, of all the things that Jesus could have said, what does he say? 
I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Do you think that Jesus thought that it was pretty important that he identified himself as the root of King David? Because he understood that he is the fulfillment of all of the prophecies about the Messiah who would come. The one who would come to give himself as a sacrifice for sin and the one that would return as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's saying, I am him. I am he. I am the one that fulfilled all of the prophecies of the credentials necessary for the one who would come to be king of the earth. I am he. Now, I just want to take you to a few things because a few extra verses. We talked about Jesus as human. It makes absolutely perfect sense to understand that in that hypostatic union, he is 100% human and he is 100% God. It took both to redeem us. Only a man could redeem us from our lost estate, but only God had the power to do it both together. So when Jesus Christ returns, yes, he's 100% God, but he is also 100% human. He hasn't stopped being 100% human since his first coming. We don't see him on the earth, but when he returns, he is coming to establish a human, physical, literal, earthly kingdom in the world from Jerusalem where he will rule and reign over the nations. And we, as believers, will reign with him for that thousand years before going into what's known as the eternal state. Amen. It's a physical, literal, earthly kingdom in the, in the world. That's why we must be paying attention to what is going on in the Middle East today, because there is a movement of nations and things that are taking place that are, that are being shaped, that are moving us rapidly toward the last days and the establishment of Jesus' physical, earthly kingdom from Jerusalem. That's why it's so important to understand his human aspect, his human nature, because we don't just divorce that from our thinking and think, well, he's only coming back in the clouds and we'll be raptured up and it's, that's, that's the end. He has a purpose beyond rescuing his faithful followers and taking us to heaven in, in the clouds with him. We're going to return with him as he establishes an earthly kingdom in the world from Jerusalem. So don't divorce his the fact that he is 100% God from the fact that he is 100% human. Now, what's he gonna do when he comes back? What are, what's the first item of business on his agenda when he comes back? Look back to one of the first verses we looked at in our study, Genesis 49, 11. And I will wrap up here in just a moment. We said in verse 10, the identification of where he will come from, the tribe, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed, this is the same individual now, the one that's going to be king, the one that's going to come through the tribe of Judah, the one who is going to be ruling the nations. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Very interesting kind of phraseology there, describing this individual. His eyes, verse 12, his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Now, what was just described in the previous verse, in verse 10? It says he's going to be a lawgiver. He's going to be a king and he'll be gathering the people to himself. He's ruling the nations. This is, this is, this is projecting what he will be like when he is here, he has reestablished his, he has established his kingdom and he's ruling the nations. And it says, he's washed his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes, his eyes shall be red with wine. Turn over, if you would, to Isaiah 63. This is a prophecy about the coming of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 63. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Where is Edom? Edom is in modern-day Jordan. Parts of Edom were in modern-day Jordan and parts of northwestern Saudi Arabia today. This is to the east of the Dead Sea. 
Who is this that comes from Edom? With dyed garments from Basra. Basra was the major city in Edom at the time. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger. This is Jesus Christ as the Lion King at his return. I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. Is this little Jesus meek and mild? He outgrew those swaddling clothes from the manger 2,000 years ago. When he comes back, his robes are going to be dipped in blood, not because of his crucifixion, but because he's going to be squashing the nations in his fury and purging the earth of wickedness. I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Verse 4 of Isaiah 63, For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. All of human history has been waiting the day when the rightful king will come to establish his kingdom on the earth, to rescue his faithful, and to judge the nations and establish his kingdom on the earth. Turn over to one more verse, Revelation 19. We'll start at verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Once again, this is Jesus Christ at the end, when he's returning to earth on a white horse. He's coming to judge and make war. Look what it says, all the way back to Genesis 49. His eyes were as a flame of fire, red, just as the description in Genesis 49, 11. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. Verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he, shall, and he treadeth, what, the winepress and of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This ladies and gentlemen, is the Lion King who is coming. And he is coming very soon. It is incumbent on us to be watching, to be ready, to be prepared, and to be sharing our faith with the world. One by one. One person at a time. Because if they have not trusted in the coming Messiah and what he did as a lamb at his first coming, they will not rule and reign with him as the lion for a thousand years and into the eternal state. They will be judged like the wine press that we read about here. Jesus Christ has all the credentials. He's the promised seed that will crush the serpent's head. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of King David. And he deserves all of our glory, yeah. worship, and praise. Amen. Thank you so much. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. 
We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.